Hello and welcome to A World Confined, a brand new show here on France 24, all about this extraordinary global health crisis that's touching all of our lives. 1.9 million people infected with COVID-19, billions more under lockdown. In this program, we'll take you around the world to explore how different states are facing up to the immense political as well as health challenges of the coronavirus. We start our program in South Korea, where national elections are taking place despite the menace of COVID-19. And how is the state ensuring that people are safe when they go to cast their ballots? Well, the answer has as much to do with surveillance as it does with good hygiene practices, as our reporters in Seoul have been finding out. It's election day for Ryan and his family. As the youngest child, he's voting for the first time. Two months ago, Ryan created one of the most visited websites in the country, Corona Map Live. It uses geolocalization to provide information about the movements of people who tested positive for COVID-19. The government tracks infected people's movements using surveillance cameras and credit card records. This information is then made public. Ryan spent several sleepless nights at the end of February updating his website. The site has been credited with helping South Korea to contain the virus and, in turn, enabling the country to vote in the National Assembly elections. The number of infections is 30 times lower than at the end of February. All of the voting booths have been disinfected and polling spread out over several days to avoid overcrowding. All voters must have their temperature checked. They must also disinfect their hands and wear gloves and a mask. Those with a fever are shown to separate polling booths. Even those infected with the virus, along with the tens of thousands of people in self-quarantine, were able to exercise their democratic right, voting at specially designated times. <laughs> Voter turnout reached a 20-year high. South Korea's government has warned that the battle against the virus is far from over. But on this day, democracy was the clear winner. Let's head for you now to New York, where our reporter Jessica Lamazaria has met a nurse working for a controversial American NGO. Its medics are probably more accustomed to places like Iraq and Haiti than the Big Apple, but because of the scale of the outbreak in New York, they've opened a field hospital in Central Park. A field hospital in the middle of New York's Central Park. It's been set up to care for coronavirus patients, under these tents, there are 68 beds and 10 respirators, strategically placed just a stone's throw from Mount Sinai, one of the biggest hospitals in Manhattan. Brittany Akinsola is an intensive care nurse. She looks after patients who are in a critical condition. Normally, whenever I respond in this capacity, it's in another country. I've served in Ecuador, in Haiti, even in Mosul, Iraq, um, in a war zone setting. I never could have imagined that we would be dealing with something like this right here in America, in our own country, um, in New York City. This temporary hospital was set up by an evangelical Christian non-profit called the Samaritan's Purse. The group is against gay marriage and abortion. But the situation is so bad here in New York that the mayor and the governor are taking any help they can get. There's a dire shortage of personal protective gear for healthcare workers, but this field hospital is fully stocked. The doctors and nurses working here are highly qualified. So we start by putting on our boots. 
there. We also have some face shields that help protect our face. Every single day as a staff, we take our temperature once in the morning and once at night to make sure that we're remaining asymptomatic. Dozens of patients in a critical condition have been treated here since April 1st when the field hospital opened. With several thousand dead and tens of thousands infected with the virus, New York is at the epicenter of the outbreak here in the United States. In the frantic search for a treatment to COVID-19, one word has come up again and again, and that's chloroquine. It is normally an anti-malarial drug, and for the moment there is no evidence that it is useful in the fight against the coronavirus. But nonetheless, fake news is spreading fast, including in the Ivory Coast, where there are rumours that a common tree there contains traces of the drug. Our reporters in Abidjan have the story. Neem trees are currently in high demand. The leaves and bark have long been used in traditional medicine, often brewed as a herbal tea. In Africa, it can be used to treat malaria. An online buzz about neem leaves has erupted on social media. Fans incorrectly believe they contain chloroquine. Despite insufficient studies, the drug has been anecdotally touted as an effective treatment of COVID-19 symptoms. Rosalie has seen her sales of neem explode. Lots of clients want to get better. The virus is here and we are scared. I heard the COVID-19 symptoms are similar to malaria, which we know about here. So as a result, we will try to treat ourselves with this. Neem leaves do not contain chloroquine. According to medical professionals, they could even be harmful if misused as a cure for coronavirus. Neem has anti-inflammatory properties. In the case of COVID-19, one must avoid anti-inflammatories because they have an immunosuppressant effect, which slows down immune response times and could help the virus develop in the body if it is already infected. Those self-medicating with neem leaves could be weakening themselves against an extremely aggressive virus. Medics are reminding communities that the best way to avoid infection is still to respect social distancing measures. The coronavirus is, of course, crippling the global economy. Businesses all over the planet are struggling to stay afloat. And in the German capital, Berlin, officials have come up with an idea. It is a 5,000 euro grant for small companies, no strings attached. Our reporter, Nick Spicer, has been to meet some of those small business owners who are already benefiting from that money. The grant for artists and independent workers came as a godsend of sorts to photographer Maurice Weiss. He applied and got the 5,000 euros in under 48 hours. For the past few weeks, he's been chronicling daily life in a hospital caring for COVID-19 patients. But it's his last assignment, and the months ahead look bleak. It helps us get past the bumps in the road, and there are many ahead, he says. But I figured that by May or June, things will get really hard for many freelancers, and 5,000 euros is, most of all, a sign of respect. In Berlin, the coronavirus grant has been given to 150,000 small companies and self-employed people. It's a 15-minute online process. No conditions set or documents needed. Money never to be reimbursed. Without the handout, the vintage fashion store run by Mariam Greze would go bust in under two months. It was a real psychological shock for me to have to shut the store. I didn't know how I would get by financially. The money came so quickly. It was amazing. More than a billion euros has been given out in the German capital. 11% of the population here is self-employed. We will need all those independent workers when things get better. They make the city live. Without tourism and culture, Berlin can't survive. That's why it's critical to have this rescue plan in place. All in all, Germany will spend 50 billion euros for small firms and independent workers to limit the damage, but also to get going again as fast as possible after the coronavirus crisis. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for watching. I hope we'll see you next time. And until then, let's just leave you with these extraordinary images of a world confined.